Why terms? Why don't we just negotiate a price and go from there? Why do we want terms? And what does terms even mean? It means when you're not getting the price all up front or the cash all up front, how are you going to get it to them? What are the terms of getting it to them over time? Term means over time, like term life insurance, for example, the terms market. So the reason we love terms is because monthly payment terms on real estate creates massive profits on the same house over again. And here's why. We're gonna be focusing on the houses that people actually want to live in because the houses that people wanna live in are generally gonna be only sold for cash. That market, at least from the seller's perspective, is limited to qualified buyers. People who can qualify for a bank loan, they have the credit, they have the income. Well, there's a huge market of people that aren't qualified. It doesn't mean that they're bad people. It just means that they don't meet all of the requirements that a bank would have to lend them the money. And with the prices of houses today, without a bank loan, it's awfully difficult to move into one of these more desirable houses. But when we can get a house on monthly payment terms and offer it to more than just the qualified buyer, giving them time to dot the I's and cross the T's to become qualified, we open up an exponentially larger market. Think about that. The amount of people who are making money and can make the monthly payments, but don't have the credit quality or the credit worthiness is gigantic, but a very small supply. Why? Because there's not enough people like us who are going and creating this supply. So if you'll do the things that we're talking about here and go get sellers to sell you their house in a way that allows us to satisfy that demand, you are in a winning situation. It's not going to be extremely easy at first to get your own supply of these houses, but every time you do get a supply of these houses, one, two, three, four, five, six of them, overwhelming demand and super easy to sell and super easy to profit on because we will do the things that most won't because it takes a little bit of work. So when we get these properties, we're able to make a lot of money. And it's not like there aren't many alternatives for us to create supply to meet this demand. We'll never meet the demand, but we will increase the amount of supply to satisfy some of the demand. And that's the equation you want when you're selling. You want to have more buyers than sellers. You're not gonna have very many people that you're competing against. That's why we're able to get so much more money for these houses than the people who are selling their houses in the traditional way, because they have lots of competition. Everyone who sells their house is just trying to get cashed out. Most people, right? So they're competing against everyone else. But when we're willing to offer it with terms, monthly payment terms over time, that demand is much larger and it comes at us like a freight train. So all we have to do to create that supply is get sellers to do one of these things. They might not have any equity in the property at all, so it's not that big of a deal for them. They just want to get the debt relief. So we would just take over their existing loan payments. Now, other times, maybe somebody inherited a house that's free and clear. Maybe somebody's lived in a house for a long, long time and it's free and clear. And they're like, holy cow, am I really going to pay $30,000 on my $500,000 house and realtor commissions? Why do I want to just give 30 grand away? I was just going to put the money in a bond or a CD or in the bank anyway. So we simply create a new payment structure with that seller for their equity. Now we might have a situation where somebody has a lot of equity and they still have debt on the house. Properties have appreciated over the last three or four years. So somebody who bought a house five years ago, the way the market has gone in some markets, it could be double. And we'll come up with some terms surrounding that so that they have their equity. It's on their balance sheet as far as their net worth. They are owed $200,000 and it's backed by the real estate. So they have that and they just don't have it in cash. So sometimes we'll just work out a deal where we're taking over the debt and getting financing for their equity from the seller. The three things that I just mentioned all involve the seller deeding us the property where we actually get title to the property, which means if we were to be bad guys and not pay them, they would have to foreclose to get us off theoretically, 
we wouldn't make them do that. We'd just give them the property back, but they don't know that. So they don't want to be in a position where they might have to foreclose. So they're like, I can't give up that deed until I've been paid in full. And in those cases, we might just lease the home with them. Hey, it's not a, not a big deal. We'll rent it from you. You just got to give us the option to buy it for the price that we'll agree on during the term of the lease. So you don't transfer the deed until we actually exercise that option and consummate the actual sale and, and buy it. So you can still get all the benefits without the things that are giving you grief. Are you good with that? And we can get deals that way. We don't have to force feed anybody. We don't have to force feed them. If they won't do any of that, well, that's why I want you to get the realtor license because you've now developed a feeling within them of your genuineness, of your character, of your integrity because you're not force feeding them anything. You've told them what you're trying to do and how it would work out. If they're not feeling that, okay, well, you're kind of left with the last option, which is the traditional option. You just straight up sell it to a retail price paying because that's what you want. You want full retail value. That person's going to own or occupy the house. They're not an investor and they're bank qualified. And the people who are bank qualified are the red carpet is laid out for them by realtors. And since that red carpet is laid out for them by realtors, in terms of them not even having to pay for the services effectively, they're all represented, which means you're gonna end up paying a commission. So that's what I was saying about you could get all your money. Look, our role guys and gals, it's just to ask questions of the seller, learn what they're willing to do, learn what they're not willing to do, and place them in the right method that they're ultimately gonna choose, okay? So let's divide this up just a little bit here. So seller financing, owner financing, carry back financing, that's all synonymous. Where some people seem to get confused, you have to understand, you seller financing means that there is an actual sale of the house. There's an actual closing of the house where the deed is transferring to you. It's just that the seller is providing the purchase money, even though it's not like a real cash thing going across the table, because otherwise it would just go right to them, right? The seller is financing this for them so that they can sell the house, transfer the deed, and then we as the buyer have to make payments to them over time until we pay them off in full. So seller financing, owner financing, carry back financing, any of the nomenclature you want to use, it's only applicable to the sale of a property. The seller is not going to receive that price that we agreed on in cash at the closing because they're providing the financing. Unlike when they do receive all the cash, they're still financing on the property, but the financing for the buyer is coming from a bank. The bank brings all the money in, gives it to the seller, and then we're gonna be paying the bank because the bank financed us. So we're removing the bank from the picture and allowing the seller to collect the monthly payments on the money that they're owed instead of all the cash at once. That means that the property is transferring, the deed is transferring, transferring just like it would in a regular sale. Okay, so the seller in these cases, they're opting to receive a promissory note which is protected by a mortgage meaning if we don't pay on that note they have collateral the collateral is the mortgage or the house that they would get back and the note the promissory note outlines how the payments are going to be made until it's paid in full but they're going to have a note that spells out the terms of the financing and they're going to have a mortgage which is the collateral allowing them to get the house back if we don't meet the terms of the note meaning the property transfers to us, the seller doesn't own it anymore, but they do have the house as collateral for the note that they gave us saying that we owe them the money. Now, if that's confusing, let's go deeper on it. The point is that there's going to be a contract that outlines the payment. Usually it's a monthly payment. It's gonna outline the duration of that payment. It's gonna outline if there's an interest rate, it's gonna outline when the entire amount that is still owed is due. And that's called a promissory note. And that note is actually just like what a bank would get. And it can be enforced, you know, like if the bank was financing you as a buyer, it can be enforced through legal channels if needed. So this mortgage or this deed of trust is actually linked with the note because it's the collateral so that that asset, if you don't pay on it, if you don't do what you say, can be taken back if the note is not paid. Now, depending on what we learn from the seller, there's certain other instruments that we're going to use in these seller finance deals. For example, I'm big across the board, if there's underlying financing, I'm using a wraparound mortgage. Now I know there's 
opinions out there that don't like that but that's because they don't want to protect the seller and I do want to protect the seller because it helps me get the deal done number one it allows me to sleep better at night knowing if some God forbid something happens to me that seller didn't get screwed over because I protected them from the very beginning so I give them a wraparound mortgage now what does that actually mean this is the type of mortgage where there's an underlying loan on the house and that seller might need that protection in case me, the buyer, would happen to not pay because I want to give them a means to get the house back if that happened. I lose my faculties. I don't know what I'm doing anymore. I get hit by a bus, whatever. You know, lots of things can happen. And, you know, maybe people in my estate don't know how to deal with it. I just want to set it up where the seller's going to be fine. So that's one thing. In other words, you just take over the mortgage like a lot of people are doing. If you just do that, and something like that happens and you stopped paying, that seller's out of the picture, folks. Doesn't matter that their name is on the loan. They're out of the picture. They don't have any means of foreclosing you off. The underlying bank would have to foreclose you off. And what does that mean? If the underlying bank has to do that work, guess whose credit is at risk? The seller, because their name is on the loan, not yours. So in this case, I'm giving a promissory note and mortgage that wraps around the underlying note that gives the seller some rights should I not pay so they can go in and fix the situation and get the house back without having their credit destroyed. This is why the people who are teaching sub two, most of them are teaching it entirely wrong because they're putting the seller at increased risk and they're doing it in such a cavalier manner that we're going to end up seeing regulation on this that is going to make things more difficult for us to do business. Now here's the other problem that is created that we fix. If we're taking over a loan that still has 25, 30 years left on it, at some point during that big of a time frame, it's likely that they're going to need to get credit for something. It could be a car, it could be a business loan, it could be a, a loan for kids college education, it could be lots of things, right? But that creditor is going to look and see that they have this big old debt that's in their name and they're going to say, oh, well, your income from your job doesn't seem to be enough to cover all this debt that you have. We need you to be at under 50% debt to income to qualify for this loan or under 35% or whatever it is. And they're like, oh, well, that debt is being paid. Well, who's it being paid by? Well, this guy that I sold the house to 10 years ago. Oh, well, do you have some kind of income coming through you to show that you have that as income to wash out that debt? No, it's with like a servicing company. Or no, they're just paying it. Folks, that is a massive headache. I'm not saying it can't be overcome. We don't want to give our sellers massive headaches. So we just fix it. With this wraparound mortgage fixes it because they now do have a note showing that they have income that they can then report to that creditor, potential creditor, that wipes out that underlying debt. Okay, that's why we do it because it, it only costs us a few hundred dollars more to do this. And I wanna do that for my seller. I hope that you will too. That way it doesn't hurt their chances to obtain future credit. Okay, so ultimately the reason I use wraparound mortgages where people say, no, don't do that. There's not even a good reason for people to say not to do that, but ultimately we do it for those reasons above, it gives them a right to get the property back. It helps their debt to income ratio if they want to get credit later. But also, when we go and sell with owner financing, we're certainly going to be using a wrap because we want to be able to collect a favorable payment spread between our buyer and our seller who originally financed the house to us. So what do I mean by that? Well, a wraparound doesn't have to be a mirror wrap. So like when I buy from the seller, I'll mirror wrap it, meaning I will wrap the exact terms on that underlying bank loan so that they're protected in the ways I just described. But when I sell on yet another wraparound mortgage that's wrapping around my wrap, when I sell, it's still gonna wrap around everything, but I might make it interest only. On the underlying loan, it might be principal and interest is both contemplated and I'm just getting interest only. Now, why would I do that? Because this loan over here to my buyer, which is you know on a wrap, is not being paid down at all. It stays the same, the amount they owe me. The underlying wrap is going down, 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 down because there's some principal that's being paid off. So I create a massive spread that way. 